Hi, this is Dr. A with your um, review for clinical chemistry on total protein in albumin. So as a review, of course, the um, a protein is a sequence of amino acids and uh, which amino acids in what order they are put in um, is part of the primary structure. And then that causes the R groups and each amino acid to interact with each other and start forming um, secondary structures, which are, for example, alpha helixes here and beta sheeted plates, but also random coils. As these start to form, then the protein takes on a tertiary structure or three-dimensional uh, structure with a few disulfide bonds and some, uh, some hydrogen bonds forming also. So every protein has a tertiary structure, three-dimensional structure, which the three-dimensional structure is what gives it its function and it's really important in proteins. And then if you take several proteins uh, and assemble them together, you get basically a quaternary structure. And an example here would be uh, heme with two alpha and two beta globin chains. So um, physical and chemical composition of proteins. So every function in living cells depends on protein. So motion, biochemical reaction, cell structure, transport antibodies, etc. All proteins contain nitrogen, which is um, what makes them unique because your carbs and your fats, they also they just contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in varying amount, with carbs usually containing more oxygen than fats. But the proteins have, have nitrogen. They all have nitrogen. And so that distinguishes them from carbs and fats. Simple proteins are amino acids only. So they and it can be a lot of them. It could be like thousands or tens of thousands of amino acids, but they're simple proteins, just amino acids. And then you have conjugated proteins are proteins plus a non-protein. Um, and so the protein part is usually called the apoprotein, and then the non-protein part is called the prosthetic group. That prosthetic group could be uh, a metal ion, like a mag or or a zinc or something like that, or it could be uh, another molecule like a, a lipid or a carb that's attached to the protein. So lipoproteins would be an example of conjugated protein. And then most plasma proteins are negatively charged at normal blood pH. And this is due to the fact that the blood pH is greater than the net charge of the protein, its isoelectric point. Uh, the greater the charge, the greater the solubility in water. Uh, the function of proteins, so a lot of them are transporters, so albumin transport stuff. And lipoproteins that transport um, lipids, obviously, transcortin, uh, transports cortisol, thyroid binding globulin, thyroxine, and there are many, many more. This is just a few examples. They are also receptors, uh, so they would be on the surface uh, of cells, on the cell membrane, uh, and they will transmit hormonal signals into the cells. So glycoproteins, for example, are receptors. Um, enzymes, they, um, enzymes facilitate chemical reactions. So enzymes are usually globulins and metalloproteins. Uh, and then they're part of the structure of body tissues, for example, collagen and keratin. Um, and they can maintain colloid osmotic pressure. Um, that's the role of albumin, which means it keeps water where the protein is present. So uh, that can help you maintain blood pressure and stuff like that too. The, um, they, there are antibodies, so they help you fight infections. Those are globulins, but more specifically immune globulins, and they are part of coagulation also. So um, your total protein, uh, if you look at it, is more than half of its albumin, and the rest of them are all these varying globulins. Not specifically just antibodies, just there's a bunch of different globulins. Uh, the concentration um, is affected by nutritional status, physiological changes, syn synthesis rate, and clearance rate. So uh, inflammation will increase some acute phase proteins, or so they're usually called acute phase reactants. CRP is one of them. Uh, while it can decrease others, such as albumin. So that affects the um, also, well, it affects the composition, at least, of the protein mix. Uh, protein clearance, so protein catabolism is normal. You actually don't have any way to store protein in your body, so you're always uh, breaking it down and um, building new protein and stuff. The half-life of the protein does vary by protein. Proteases are enzymes that break them down into reusable amino acids and then non-protein nitrogenous compounds. That would be a separate video, uh, but um, NPNs are... Um, like waste products such as urea, creatinine, and stuff like that. Uh, 
Uh, protein losing states are starvation and nephrotic syndrome. For example, then you would expect to have low protein, serum protein levels in those. So um, hypoproteinemia is low levels of protein in the blood. It will occur in any condition where there's a negative nitrogen balance in um, those ne negative nitrogen balance can be caused by excessive loss, a decrease intake, decrease synthesis, or accelerated breakdown of protein. So an excessive loss would be, for example, nephrotic syndrome, where your kidneys are losing large amount of protein. And so that would be excessive loss. Decreased intake, starvation is the example there, obviously, or simply not taking in enough proteins in your diet, not eating enough, etc. Decreased synthesis could be due to liver issues, so if you have cirrhosis of the liver and all that, since the liver produces pretty much all the proteins except for the immune globulins, um, you know, if it's not working optimally, you could have problems synthesizing all the proteins or an accelerated breakdown of proteins if you're having some catabolic process going on. Hyperprotein anemia, so too much protein in blood, is doesn't occur as much. So it occurs usually in dehydration. That's the most common. And it's not so much that you've made more protein. It's just that you've lost the water that the protein's diluted in. So it's actually just a relative increase because of the loss of water. And um, you can have some hyperproteinemia from excessive produ production. It's usually an excessive production of gamma globulins and um, seen in conditions like uh, cancers like multiple myeloma or uh, Waldens from microglobulinemia and stuff like that. Um, so how do we analyze just total proteins? So it's just seeing the level of total protein, not specifically what's in there. Uh, you can look at total nitrogen, which would measure all, chemi all chemically bound nitrogen in a sample, so plasma or urine, and it uses chemiluminescence. Um, and that's useful in assessing nitrogen balance, but then your total protein methods um, most often are used, uh, measured in serum. Um, and your methods are um, the uh, gel doll, which is the like, classic method, and it looks actually at nitrogen contents. There's refractometry um, that can be used. The Bayeret method is actually the most widely used, and the Bayeret method looks at peptide bonds. And then there's also dye binding. Um, that one um, is very similar to the method for albumin. It just uh, capitalizes on the fact that proteins tend to bind dyes. Uh, so obviously, the stronger the color, the more protein is present. Uh, a reference, our reference interval for total protein is between 6.5 and 8.3 grams per deciliter for ambulatory adults or normal patients that are walking around and are uh, healthy. So what do you do if you want to know what proteins are present instead of how much total? So um, there are several methods. Salt fractionation will use a sodium salt to cause a precipitation of the globulins and leaves behind albumin, which then can be measured. Um, albumin is usually uh, measured by the binding of positively charged albumin with anionic dye, so a dye method, dye binding method. Um, and we're going to look at albumin here in just a minute. And uh, total globulins, the measurement of the total globulin level in serum can be done by colorimetric methods using uh, black oxalic acid. Um, and then albumin can then be calculated by subtracting globulin from total protein. Usually, actually, we do the other way around. We measure total protein, measure albumin, and the globulin would be the difference between the two. Of course, then there's the electrophoresis method, which is the separation of proteins on the basis of electric charge densities. And then you would have, you would see patterns like you would have the albumin peak, and then you would have the different globulins with alpha, beta, and gamma globulins. Um, but there's alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2, etc. And so they would precipitate out in the band, and you can see if there's an increase in any or decrease in any of those. And um, there's also high resol resolution protein electrophoresis. So it allows further separation of the proteins in as many as 12 bands. It uses a higher voltage cooling system and more concentrated buffer than regular electrophoresis. Then there's also capillary electrophoresis, um, which allows the separation of molecules uh, in silica capillaries. Um, there's isoelectric focusing, which is a zone electrophoresis that separates protein on the basis of their isoelectric point. And there are several immunochemical methods which uh, look at the reaction of proteins and antibody.
uh, which is basically immunochemistry. Um, and they're usually referred to as immunofixation and not listed here, but still important, of course, mass spectrometry. Mass spectrometry can tell you so much, right? So um, body fluid proteins, we can, use, we can measure urinary proteins. So that would be, for example, relevant in nephrotic syndrome. So um, if plasma proteins show up in urine, uh, it's usually because they've passed through the re renal glomerulus uh, and they have not been reabsorbed by renal tubules. So amino acids can be easily reabsorbed. Proteins are kind of too big. So usually once they've been lost um, and they've left the plasma and entered um, the glomerulus, then uh, they're going to be on their way out. The method of measurement for urinary proteins are usually quanti uh, qualitative with the reagent test strips, uh, precipitation like the sulfosilic acid method, and dye binding, and immunochemical, which again we just uh, talked about, crosses over with a lot of the serum methods, obviously. And cerebrospinal fluid or CSF um, fluid proteins, um, we might want to look at that because abnormally increased levels occur in conditions where there is an increased permeability of the endothelial barrier, barrier through which ultrafiltration occurs. So you'll, if you have conditions like uh, bacterial, viral, and fungal meningitis, tra a traumatic tap, multiple sclerosis, um, an obstruction, neoplasm, a disc herniation, uh, cerebral infarction, all of those will cause uh, high readings on your CSF protein, which is what you're interested in to see. And so then let's talk specifically about albumin, again, the largest component of total protein, more than half of total protein. Uh, and albumin is found in serum, spinal fluid, interstitial fluid, urine, and amniotic fluid. And uh, it's it has several functions, but it is responsible for most of the colloid osmotic pressure of intravascular fluid. So basically, it maintains the appropriate fluid balance in tissue. So it base it pulls water back to itself uh, and keeps the, the the water balance between tissue and the intravascular compartment. So in your veins and capillaries and etc. The um, albumin, of course, then also transports a lot of things: thyroid hormones other fat soluble hormones and conjugated bilirubin, fatty acids, even some drugs hitch rides on uh, albumin. Um, so increased levels of albumin are seen in dehydration for the same reason you see increases in total protein. It's not that you make more albumin, it's just that you've lost the water that the albumin is um, dissolved in and so you have a basically a relative increase. And then uh, decreased levels are more significant. That's usually what you're looking for. It's like if they don't have enough albumin, uh, and it could be a sign of malnutrition, malabsorption. So malabsorption would occur with a lot of the GI diseases that are inflammatory, uh, where you're just not absorbing what you're eating. And liver diseases, then where you can't produce it because your liver's failing and your liver produces a lot of the proteins. Renal loss, like nephrotic syndrome, and of course, hemodilution where uh, like an excess um, IV fluids and stuff like that. The lab procedures for analysis of albumin, the we use a binding of positively charged albumin with anionic dyes by electrostatic forces, as we mentioned before. Uh, it's a, usually a color reaction using either bromcrestal green or bromcrestal purple, and you use a spectrophotometer to measure the intensity of the color, which would be then directly proportional to the albumin concentration. And that is your presentation on total protein and albumin. Thanks for watching.